Okay, we're starting with veterinary ethics. This is a funny video of some strange laws that are out there, but realistically, after you watch that, I'd like you to think of some other laws that you might know about. For example, the Arizona hot car law. What does that entail? And then also, if there is an animal hit by a car, can you sue the person who hit your animal? Or is it the other way around? And the person whose car got hit can sue you for damages to their car. Lots of uh, objectives to cover in this. A lot with veterinary ethics deals with not only ethics, but the laws, our principles, and things to do with that. So all members of the healthcare team are required. So when it comes to animal professions and ethics and animal welfare, it's all linked. And how our values impact our assessment. So ethics is a branch of philosophy which loosely translates to mean love and wisdom. It generally considers the question of what should I do? It assumes that there are right or wrong answers, better or worse. Ethics is really an umbrella term for belief principles and rules determining what is right or wrong. Think of it as if you had the power to be invisible, whether you use that power for your own personal gain and decide to go rob the bank, or you use the power to help the greater good of others. So similarity in nursing or animal science, students will develop special skills, knowledge, and registration entitlement. An example of this would be like our certification exam from NAPTA afterwards. So we also develop the ability to treat problems with the veterinarian and veterinary acts of science and everything that comes with your role. And you can use this for good or for harm. So with great power comes great responsibility. What does this mean to the veterinary professional? Well, poor ethical decisions may not be simply about power, but may arise out of ignorance or laziness. An example of this is like knowing what is right. And if you had a contagious parvo patient and you did not properly clean the kennel after you knew that there was a patient with parvo and you know how to properly clean a kennel. That would be ignorance or laziness or considered negligence. So why is ethics so challenging? Well, cultural, legal, and economical factors may lead to animals being kept or treated in a manner that is not conductive for their welfare. So veterinary professional students have the desire to improve the way animals are treated, but in translating ethical principles into action, it can be challenging. This is quoted by uh, Verenner and Phillips in their 2014 article, but only 37% said that they would act on an ethical dilemma, and only 54% admitted to being concerned, but doing nothing about it. So quite often we cannot control some of the ethical situations. So, veterinary ethics. Right versus wrong, fair versus unfair, good versus bad, personal, professional, social. So normal ethics address the question of what should I do and why. A widely accepted principle that is wrong to harm another human is an example of this. Descriptive ethics refers to the factual investigation of moral beliefs and conduct. The psychology, neurobiology, sociology, and anthropology of beliefs. So not participating and euthanizing a healthy companion animal because the client wants it. That also has to do with uh, conflicts um, between interests and some of our ethical dilemmas that we are faced with often. 
There's also systematic study of ethics. These are propositions and looks for consistency, contraindications, and wider implications, as well as examining the way ethics propositions are justified. So is it wrong to kill an animal for sport when we kill animals for food? And then there's also an example of this is like deep respect for cows in India. Um, but so much respect that they will not euthanize, so they are allowed to die from starvation instead of being euthanized. And then we call meta-ethics a study of ethical reasoning, moral knowledge, and ethical truth. So it's what is good, what is right and wrong, and how can we tell the difference. So one thing that is ethical um, is the charge of services. Every time there is a recommended course of treatment, there is a potential conflict of interest. The benefit of the patient versus the benefit of the owner versus the benefit of the practice. So conflicts between interest of animals, clients, industry, and society as a whole continues to take ethical toll on the veterinary professionals. So one thing we can do to try to help learn more about ethics and create some good obje objectives is start with awareness. To recognize ethical issues um, and values. And then knowledge and be able to identify the animal welfare laws and regulations and the codes of conduct. Some skills and qualities to develop would be like decision making, communication, ethical reasoning, personal identity, and professional identity. So some motivations for behaving ethically to feel good, to have a good reputation, to obey the law, to achieve better outcomes, to avoid stress, to avoid guilt, to follow the professional code of conduct, to avoid punishment, to get a reward, being told by my parents, to fit in with my friends, religion, and because I am a good person. AVMA standards. So patients' needs are placed first, we want to relieve suffering and pain, and then we consider ethical when these obligations are fulfilled, so doing what is right. So the difference between believing in something and acting on it. Action requires conviction, effort, and time and belief that the benefit will outweigh the cost. So do you believe, this is hard because there are some things, like you may not believe certain animals such as uh, SeaWorld got brought up because that is an ethical thing, but you may not believe that they should be kept in captivity, but the way of the cost and what you would have to do to try to get that changed is probably why not a lot of people have gone against that benefit because it's what society wants. But other things is, do you believe animals should always have the ability to act how they do in nature? If so, do we need to start shipping gazelle to zoos so that the wild cats can hunt as they would in nature? Is this ethical? So this case presentation, you have an employment interview. He has no other employees, but you enter the practice and there's a strong odor of urine and the equipment is old, even though he says it works just fine. But then you notice that the films do not have any identification on them. Please pause here and think about what you should do. What is this a violation of? All right, yes, it is a medical record violation. We are required to put the identification things on the radiographs, but Right versus wrong. Does it smell like urine because he needs help and it's understandable that he cannot keep up with the demands of the clients and the practice? So, or is it wrong? Surely there must be some health code violation or is this because the urine is down in the drain really far and you can't quite get to it? And would there be a law requiring purchase of up-to-date equipment? I have not found that one yet. So, do you really turn him in? And what happens if the board shuts him down? And Princess Pumpkin Noodle, who needs her medication to really fill, and no other vet can get her in for weeks, and she collapses and dies. Who is ethically responsible at that point? Ethical practices. The point of making an assessment would be to consider all aspects. 
It would be great to just ask the animals how they feel about treatments. We often are only viewing the extremely stressful experiences, but they may have a good quality of life altogether. So practicing below standards in patient care. So is it considered standard to give an anti-emetic medication after you made them vomit to vomit up something toxic that they ate? Say a dog eats chocolate, you make them vomit, and they're feeling sick and nauseous. Would it be a good standard? Or is this just called practicing good medicine? How to conduct welfare assessment. The effect of an action, disease, or husbandry practice. We should make full use of literature, experience of experts, make checklists, and does this reflect a lifetime or is it just what's happening in the present? Owners can contribute to this, especially when discussing euthanasia. We have them identify what the animal still enjoys, but also keep in mind that they may be limited to what problems they can recognize. They might not recognize something that is found later on the veterinary examination. Developing skills to honor the best practice model. So usually we are prioritizing life-threatening threatening problems first. This has become a specific challenge to the veterinary medicine today because often with the short staffing of veterinarians, we are turning away patients that do need treatment, but we have to prioritize the life-threatening problems above that. We call that triage. If there is a plan of care, if there is something that you can do, it would be a good standard to practice doing it. If you notice that an animal's temperature is low, this is something that we can do as veterinary nurses. We do not have to have the doctor initial a treatment of put some heat source on. That is something that we can initiate as a nurse and for our best practice model. We can reevaluate patients. We may not be able to change their medication, but we can evaluate them and be the ones to help recognize things to the veterinarians. Confidentiality. Pretty much follow this as an absolute. Patient info is private, not to be shared with anyone. Taking, we're taking clients' information. There's no selling of info. Hopefully you can come up and think of a few examples of how you could breach confidentiality, but we need to treat it just as strongly as the human profession does and not give away client information. So to work on thinking about ethical dilemmas and what kind of aspects would you take as a person, what defines what is important to you, or how what is an animal's worth, how does it benefit humans, what are some decisions that we think of when we think of ethical dilemmas in the veterinary medicine. Some of the common ones are a matter of if there is a choice between saving a human or saving an animal, most likely it is chosen to save the human first. But take a look at these and decide what would you save off the boat first. Don't forget about the homework and looking into the Arizona laws and statutes. That is the link to get into the Arizona Veterinary Board. The Veterinary Practice Act. So, rules and regulations are 311.703. This is not only OSHA and keeping the workplace clean, but it is also professional conduct. There's also another one, the 32-2332, and that is what, uh, sorry, we go with the keeping the parvo kennel clean. There are actually not only ethical conducts, but there are laws associated with this. All right, so our Veterinary Practice Act is a legal document. Every state has its own practice act, contains basic laws, 
definitions, licensing requirements, continuing education requirements, controlled substance um, was something that was recently passed in 2014. So mobile veterinary clinics could not control have controlled substances, yet they were doing it anyway because if they were to go out to a farm and need to euthanize an animal, which would be a controlled substance, if they did not have the law saying that they could carry controlled substances in their mobile vehicles, they would not have been able to euthanize. So that was the dilemma that was placed on veterinarians where the law stated one thing but their moral ethics and what they uh, vowed to do with the code of conduct and relieve suffering enabled them to be able to still carry the drugs in their mobile vehicles. So the State Board of Veterinary Medicine is the one who writes the rules and regulations. So the rules and regulations of the Veterinary Practice Act written by the State Board. That is highlighted, take note of that. Other responsibilities of the Veterinary State Board is evaluating compliance of male practice and ethical values. So mostly their job is to support the consumer. So if a client makes a complaint about something, they're going to the Veterinary State Board and the Veterinary State Board is in more support of the client. If you have proven yourself with proper medical records, then the Veterinary State Board supports you. There are different members. Take note of this, it should be highlighted but there is a variety of numbers. We have veterinarians, we have sometimes a CVC, we have two public mem members that have no association with anything and some government officials. And of course an uh, attorney is on there. All right, so CE requirements. So even if you're licensed or not, is it ethical to learn as much as possible within the industry? We are taken with a great responsibility to help pets. Okay, we're going to get into law. We have common law, statutory law. Both of these apply to veterinary medicine. Animals are considered private property. So quite often when it comes with law, it becomes a matter of is it the client or owner's decision to do this. So liabilities that we have is malpractice and negligence. So negligence would be if you witness a colleague, colleague, uh, colleague taking medication and then you didn't report it. Or negligence to not follow through with something that you did know how to do. Like client communication and not putting it in the medical record. That would be negligence. All right. So we need to document everything. Um, so some ethical dilemmas that come up, requests to f destroy a healthy animal, requests for cosmetic procedures, client wishing to continue treatment despite poor quality of life, performing a procedure on a patient for the first time. This happens quite often and veterinarians are always worried about it, but sometimes there is no way around it. Can they refer that? They maybe should refer that. Is it something that they think they can do? These are ethical dilemmas that they come up to. So the inability to treat an animal because of funds. All right, what does it mean by crimes of moral turpitude? Pause, take a second to read.
All right, so OSHA is more veterinary laws. We have ADA. We also have like the FDA and the USDA that also place standards on veterinary medicine. We get a bite, the law does not protect us because we are under the assumption that we have training and there is always a risk. Workman's comp will cover it, but void of this legal action, um, can be we cannot take against the client or the facility. And if owner discloses that a pet has tendency to bite, we definitely cannot take any legal action against there. There are emergency laws where vets have immunity in most states if emergency or a pet is euthanized, um, if the owner is not found or a scanner is not available. An animal without an owner does not have a right to care. Veterinarian technicians that are providing emergency care and support do have a law protecting them from being sued should the animal die because they were trying to act in an emergency case. So FDA for food and drug, DEA regulates our controlled substances. Those are drugs that are of higher addiction. So the DEA likes to keep track of that. There's the Animal Welfare Act and animal rights. There's sometimes breed specific laws. I know the city of Denver made a legislation that could not give breed specific mandates. Then they over wrote it by what was called a home rule and a large enough community was able to make their own decisions. And this outlawed for certain breeds such as pit bulls to um, be allowed in premises. There is always like when people have the dog come in and they want you to put a lab mix and it looks very clearly like a pit bull and they want you to sign something stating that so that they can take it to their place of rental. How do you ethically feel about that? Do you think this could come back on you? We cannot accurately determine breeds by looks, so there is a large study saying accuracy by looks is not very high. So look into animal rights and animal welfare on the notes. See if you can compare and contrast. Which one do you agree with more? Going back. Sometimes there's minimum standard of care versus humane acts of slaughter. There's care versus cruelty like fighting. There's neglect sometimes like overgrown nails if we are not educating clients on what that causes, causes arthritis with overgrown nails. There's also anesthesia, fluids, euthanasia, and drug checks with animal rights and animal welfare. An example of a breach of contract would be firing a client. It's not unusual to put liens on a client for not paying a bill or for firing them for inappropriate conduct. Go ahead and try to work on this paper. Please pause here. Right, some of our organizations, this is what regulates how many continuing education things we have to get. That is our NAFTA, our National With the Veterinary Nurse Initiative, how are our duties similar to nurses in concerns with ethics? What are some of the reasons for a high rate of attrition in veterinary assistants and technicians? That would be found on the previous article, How to Thrive as a Veterinary Professional. Why would you want to become a member of an organization? And here is some veterinarian organization, the AVMA, 
So compare and contrast some Arizona standards of care or some AHA standards of care. Often there are 15 minute monitoring as the Arizona standard of care and AHA standards is five minute. There may not be regulations on how often you can use uh, an IV fluids bag for subcutaneous fluids, but AHA standards of care is to only use it once. There are different things for checking um, catheters and that. But based on this picture, do you want to be looked at like a nurse or a mechanic? Quite often it's frustrating that we are compared to as auto mechanics. Uh, the statement is made when owners are frustrated with the cost to fix an animal. But if we are showing that we are doing the highest level standards of care, we should be looked at as medical professionals. Take a moment and look over this vaccine reaction and see what you think the outcome is. There is the conclusion. These were found on a pet case studies. I do do believe there are some things that might have been missing. Yes, if the animal was indeed left to go home with something like that. However, I do find that quite often owners are wanting easier, quicker fixes and probably declined a lot of the testing to figure out what was going on with the animal. So then the veterinarian's hands were tied and it does look like there was a case of uh, negligence or malpractice when in fact it probably was not.